Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Skype a Scientist Live. Uh, my name is Sarah McAnulty. I run the Skype a Scientist program. And today we are joined by our ant biologist, uh, William Beckerson. We're really excited to hear all about fu how fungus and ants uh, interact in uh, sometimes pretty unpleasant ways for the ant, but it's pretty cool for us to learn about. So I hope you brought your curiosity with you. If you are new to Skype a Scientist Live, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, as we're talking, you are absolutely welcome to ask any questions that you have. That's really what this is all for, by submitting them into the Q&A function um, that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions whenever you want. We will try to get to as many questions as humanly possible in the next 45 minutes. Um, and that's really that's really all the, the instructions we have for today. William, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and do you want to tell us who you are, what you do, and why you like it? Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, full disclosure, though, I'm a mycologist, actually. The ants just happen to be the unfortunate Part of it. <laughs> for the, uh, the, the zombie fungus that manipulate them. So I'm currently a, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Central Florida, and we do uh, research on these really cool little critters called zombie ants. Um, so is it all right if I pull up a presentation? Yeah. Excellent. We'll still be able to see Aaron. Yeah. All right. Can everybody everybody see this all right? Mm-hmm. Cool. And then just to make things a little easier, I'm going to switch my pointer to laser. There we go. Yeah, so like I mentioned, um, I meet, uh, my crew and I study zombie ants at the University of Central Florida. Uh, but before I get talking about those, I want to briefly talk about what we mean when we say zombie, because there's lots of different concepts of what a zombie is, especially depending on what kind of films you, you may have seen. So there's a, the traditional concept of the dead come back to life uh, in, in your classical you know, Halloween movies um, and in comedies like Zombieland and the more uh, uh, commonly watched TV series, The Walking Dead, that's been going for many seasons. However, these these types of zombies are not very biologically interesting. Uh, they are firmly planted in the realm of, of fantasy and, and fiction, right? But there is a subcategory of zombie movies, ones in which there are you know pathogens or parasites that cause these zombie outbreaks and these are a little bit more biologically relevant you know the the premise basically goes a virus or a bacteria or a fungi you know starts infecting lots of people really quickly and it changes their behavior in some sort of way so when we talk about zombie ants what we're really talking about is this kind of concept where a, a pathogen or a parasite can manipulate the behavior of their hosts now, to understand how these pathogens do this, we have to talk about symbiosis. So for all of you uh, Spider-Man fans out there, you know, Venom is a great example of a symbiote, right? It's, a, it's one species that interacts with another species, right? So there are three basic flavors of symbiosis. There's mutualism, right, which is down here. So this is a, a type of symbiosis where both individuals or both species benefit. So pollinators are a great example. The insects pollinate the flowers and allow them to reproduce. And in turn, the insects get nectar and things to make honey and to eat. So in this case, both species benefit. And the next type is commensalism. So in this, this type of relationship, one species benefits and either neither really benefits nor is really harmed either. So uh, tree frogs are a great example. So the, the frog stays up in the tree, it can blend in, it gets some protection. Um, and in turn, you know, the, the tree doesn't really get any benefit, nor does it really get any kind of you know, negative effect. So the tree is just kind of there. Now, there's a, a third type, which is the one that we're a little bit more interested in with zombie ants, and this is called a parasite. And this is where one species benefits and the other is um, negatively harmed. So if you've ever had, you know, like a, a tick on a dog or a household cat, or if you've gone camping and got bitten by mosquitoes, this is a type of parasitism, right? And usually there are negative consequences for the host, right? So as I mentioned earlier, I am a mycologist, which is a fancy science word of way of saying that I study fungus. So we study these bad guy fungi or these, these uh, fungal parasites that actually infect and modify the behaviors of ants. Now to understand how, how these fungi do that, you have to know a little bit more about how fungi work. So we're all kind of familiar with these mushrooms, right? You may you know, eat them with your salad or have them on pizza, right? These are pretty tasty for the most part, but uh, mushrooms and, and other fun and fungi also have what is called a mycelium. And you can think of these as long root systems, kind of like how plants have roots. Um, and these mycelium are actually able to secrete chemicals 
And these chemicals are used in order to eat their food, right? And we, we call this external digestion. So if you've ever seen mold growing on like a, a loaf of bread or a piece of cheese, what you're actually seeing there is the, the mold is the mushroom part, but it's actually secreting all these enzymes to break down the food just like we secrete enzymes in our mouth when we get hungry, right? You start to salivate when you when it's about lunchtime. So fungi do this externally. So we call them chemotrophs. And chemotroph means chemo, chemical, and troph refers to, it's a Latin root for the way that they get their energy or the way that they get their food. So they do this through chemicals. Now, some species of uh, fungi are able to secrete chemicals that manipulate uh, a, a host, right? So they use this to infect certain uh, species. And in this case, we're going to be talking about how fungi use these chemicals to manipulate ants. So on the right here, this is this is an Ophiocordyceps fungi. So this is the actual mushroom part of the fungus, and uh, it, it basically grows out of an ant. And we, if we were to cut open this mushroom, you can see all these little tiny spores in here, these little hair-like spore structures, and these are what actually spread to new ants and infect them. So the life cycle begins when a spore lands on a new ant host. And the fungus is actually able to grow inside the ant. And then it starts to secrete these chemicals that manipulate the ant's behavior. So it zombifies these ants. So it can, these types of behavioral changes can be going from very social creatures, just like you and me. Ants are very social. They like to communicate with one another to very asocial, meaning they don't talk to each other very much. It can make them really hyperactive. Um, it can mess with their sleep cycle, so they just stay awake all the time, right? It's starting to sound kind of zombie-ish, right? But most important, they make these ants climb. So this is, this is called summiting behavior. Um, so they climb up into trees or up into plants, and once they're in the, the high spaces, this is what's useful for the fungus to reproduce and, and spread new spores that can fall on ants below. So at this point, the fungus actually causes the ant to bite down onto whatever kind of plant it's on, and it starts to erupt or grow a new mushroom out of the back of the fungus's head, uh, thus uh, completing the life cycle and, and positioning itself at a perfect spot to spread more spores onto ants below. So what we're interested in studying is what are the types of chemicals that are used in order to manipulate the behavior of their host? Or to summarize, how do these fungus zombify ants? So when we look inside the ant, one thing we notice is the fungus grows very well and eats away at the muscle tissue inside ants, but it kind of avoids the neurological tissue. It doesn't eat the brain, right? Uh, so instead it kind of grows around it. And we think that the reason it does this is to secrete chemicals into the, into the neurological systems of the ant in order to manipulate their behavior. So on the left here, I have a video for you that kind of shows normal ant behavior. Um, this is what an ant looks like when it's just walking normally. Um, so you, you, one thing you'll notice is when it's walking, it's doing what's called antenation. It's kind of got these antenna out in front. And it, what it's actually doing is sniffing or smelling for chemical trails and communicating with other ants. Now, when they're infected by Ophiocordyceps, these ants no longer do that antenation right they, they kind of look more like antlers like like a like a deer would have and instead they just kind of really hyperactively run across these arenas until they bump into a wall and they kind of stumble and they just turn and start running again so they're they're very uh, you know how you would describe a zombie in a zombie movie and finally the, uh, when when the ant has climbed the fungus induces what's called the death grip, this biting behavior. And you can see that the ant is not particularly happy about this. It doesn't want to be latched onto that one place, but somehow the fungus is, is causing the ant to do this. So what we do at the University of Central Florida is we actually go out and we live in a very humid, warm environment, very tropical-like environment. So there's lots of zombie ants all over the place. So we go out and we find them and we bring them back to the lab and we, we, we look at you know how these these fungi actually work and we do this um, in part using an app called iNaturalist so iNaturalist is a really cool app you can download for your phone and it's kind of like Pokemon Go but for real life so you can go out into your backyard you can take a picture of a cool bug or a cool you know lizard or an animal that you find and the app will actually tell you what it thinks it is and you can save these in kind of like a, a pokedex or an inventory of cool little things that you've found before 
And what's more is it if you uh, choose the option, it will add a GPS location to show where you found it. So scientists who are interested in studying these organisms can know where to look for them. Or if you are interested in finding a particular organism, like a zombie ant, you can actually look where people have found them before and go to those kind of parks or, or those natural reserves and find them for yourself. Uh, iNaturalist also has these really cool leaderboards. So it's kind of like a game. So here's a, a map of Florida for the zombie ants that we work with. Um, and you can see that there, there's a leaderboard for who has found uh, the most of these types of zombie ants uh, in certain areas. So if you're interested in using the app, I, I highly recommend downloading it. You can also follow us on Twitter uh, at Zombie Antics. We also have a website, the Zombie Fungus Foray, where you can learn more about our project and learn more about the zombie ant life cycle and where to find them. Um, and you know, if you're interested in talking more in depth about these topics, you can always send me an email. And I fr very frequently meet with you know, K through 12 classrooms and show them some more cool research that we're doing in the lab. And, uh, and you know, at least pre-COVID, we actually used to go take people out and look for zombie ants uh, as, as a group, um, these what we call zombie hunts, right? So um, yeah, these are really fun activities that you can do if you're kind of bored <laughs> and your own. Um, but uh, I hope you guys are at least somewhat excited about these zombie ants now and I'm very grateful for having me and love to answer any questions that you guys have. That was awesome. Thank you so much. We have uh, questions coming in already. And if you in the audience have questions, submit them. This is the time. All right. So um, grade six classroom in Jamestown, Rhode Island. Question from Kaylin. How long does it take for the spore to germinate and grow into a new organism on or in the ant? Uh, excellent question. So uh, I, I thought I might have had a bonus slide for that, but I guess I, I, I left it out. But uh, on average, when the ant is first infected, there's not a whole lot going on. So once it germinates and it's inside, it's kind of getting established and you start to see behavioral changes around the two week mark. So like 12 to 14 days. And at that point, there's a really big, what we, we in science call the die off or uh, basically most of the ants become manipulated and the fungus starts to grow, right? So uh, around two weeks to three weeks is the completion from spore all the way to new mushroom. Cool. Um, Charlene would like to know, does this affect dead ants too, or does the ant have to be alive for the fungus to grow? Great question. So in this particular species, they need live ants. And the reason they need live ants is because they need the ant to climb up the tree so that they can be at a good position to drop spores, right? If you infect an ant on the ground, uh, you might be able to spread a little bit, but nowhere near as far as if you can get the wind to kind of carry your spores away. Now, I've only talked about one species of zombie ant. There's all kinds of different like uh, cordycep fungi out there that do weird things. And in particular, there's one species that actually infects dead ants in what we would call a refuse pile, or you can think of it as a graveyard. So basically ants like to have these kind of uh, dumpster sites where they take all their garbage, especially things like leaf cutter ants, and they put them you know, really far away from the colony. And there's certain species of, of zombie fungi that will infect the dead ants in these graveyards. So the ants that are taken out and put putting out there and they will grow their stock. So when another worker comes and deposits new garbage or new trash, they get infected and go back to the colony and then they die and are taken back to the graveyard and then the mushroom comes out. So it's another type of cycle that doesn't require necessarily the, the live action that uh, these uh, ophiocordyceps do. Cool. Aaron, are you good? Your audio keeps cutting it now. Okay. Um, okay, it's cool. Uh, well, do your, do your best. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, Charlene would like to know what other organisms can get hijacked by parasites? Okay, so that did unlock one of my bonus slides. Is that okay if I- uh, Oh yeah, it? go for it. Okay. And there should be some kind of like animation for unlocking bonus slides. <laughs> Okay, so I did prepare one slide here of some other examples of uh, zombie critters, right? So this one right here is actually a snail that's zombified by a worm. So the, the worm actually causes it to do this summoning behavior where it climbs up onto a plant and kind of displays itself to birds. 
and the worm actually lives in the eye stock and it like jumps up and down. Uh, so it like makes this like almost like uh, one of those folks that bring in airplanes with those law with those like neon lights. It basically causes the, the the snail to go up onto the plant and say, "Hey birds, I'm here, come eat me." And then the, the the parasite here, the worm actually grows inside the bird and the bird poops it out where it infects new snails. So this is kind of a two host system where it, it completes the cycles. Uh, but there's also examples of zombie crabs. Um, there's zombie uh, grasshoppers that are infected by another type of worm. And this actually causes the grasshoppers hopper to jump into water, even though grasshoppers can't swim and they drown, but the worm likes to reproduce in water. So it like it's against its own best interest. Um, you can even talk about uh, types of, you know, uh, protists uh, that can infect mice and make them less afraid of cats. So you know, they they go against their own instincts. So there's there's plenty of examples of of behavioral altering uh, pathogens and parasites out there. Very cool. Um, so let's see what happens uh, if a bigger animal was to eat one of the ants that's infected with by the fungus. Okay, so in this particular system, uh, if something else were, you know, to like get the fungus on their hands, nothing would happen. So the the fungus are so particular to these ants that there's actually different species of Ophiocordyceps for different species of carpenter ants. So the Ophiocordyceps that infects the ants that we have here in Florida does not infect the ants that you might find, you know, in California or in, in so, if, if another it, you know frog or something were to eat that insect, they wouldn't be bothered by uh, the Ophiocordyceps. Good. Um, Natalie wants to know, do zombie ants still eat? Uh, good question. Um, that's something I'm not entirely sure about. I guess it depends on what stage of the infection that you're at. So definitely in the first couple of weeks, it's kind of business as usual. They still contribute to um, you know, the, the nest and, you know, they go out and they look for food and they look for like water in the lab, we feed them sugar water. So they still go to those reservoirs. Um, but yeah, once, once the behavioral manipulation starts, they kind of become an, anti, so anti-social, no pun intended. And they, uh, kind of walk away from the nest and kind of climb trees. So I think at that point they're, they're no longer really interested in, in eating or drinking. Cool. Um, Leo would like to know, do these parasites know what they're infecting? Um, that's also a great question. So in evolution and evolutionary biology, uh, people often talk about, you know, creatures as doing things intentionally that are good for them, but it's more or less a game of trial and error, right? So if you are a opiocordyceps fungi and you are super aggressive and you infect very quickly, like let's say you just you grow your mushroom in the ant in two days rather than two weeks, what happens is you don't give enough time for the ant to climb the tree and then and spread your spores. So basically you're stuck on the ground and you don't, your, your offspring or your generation don't make it to the next generation because they're, they're not up in the tree and able to spread. So this is called selection. Basically the pathogens that are too aggressive die off because they can't spread. And the pathogens that are not effective enough never you know, completely take over the ant. So it's a very fine tuned back and forth. And you can see, see this out in nature um, you know, in populations, it's a constantly evolving system. So to, to answer your question, the, the fungus don't actually know what's going on around them. They have just evolved this very intricate set of steps that they need to do that works the best. Cool. Um, Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade class, uh, Devin in particular, would like to know, um, how does the fungus provide a sudden burst of energy? Is it a chemical reaction or does it also hijack the metabolism of the ant? So that's a good question. Uh, like these are all great questions. Uh, so basically, when they're when the fungus is in the ant, they they live kind of like yeast, the, a saprophytic single cell stage, right? And they will kind of grow and reproduce. And the energy that they're getting is actually from the ant. So they're kind of eating the ant tissue, the the muscle structure, right? But avoiding the neurological tissue. 
once the death grip has been initiated, that's when the fungus really goes into overdrive and it just starts massively consuming the insect and the cells actually start to connect to form this mycelium that we talked about. And at that point, it's literally consuming the entire ant and that's where it gets its burst of energy that allows it to grow that mushroom. So the reason you don't see that mushroom growth before that point is because it, it's a really low level of, of consuming the, the insect tissue. That's awesome. Cool. Um, so what would happen, uh, this is from Isaac, what would happen if a zombie ant bit us? Good question. So unlike the, the zombie movies, the, the pathogen is not spread through like biting. So the ants aren't spreading the zombie pathogen to other ants by biting them. They spread by the spores, right? So uh, this has to do with the fungus life cycle. So when the, when the fungus is not a spore, it's not really contagious. So if an ant were to bite you, it wouldn't spread any fungus to you. Well, that's good. What a relief. <laughs> um, let's see. So can some types of zombifying animals infect non-living things? That's from Brielle. Um, well, yeah, so there are examples of zombie fungi that grow in dead ants. Um, even the Ophiocordyceps does most of its growth of its mushroom when the ant is dead. Um, the problem with that is that things that are dead don't constantly, like uh, the previous question asked about metabolism, they don't constantly make energy or new molecules for the fungus to eat. So eventually it runs out of stuff to eat. So once the host is dead, that's kind of the end game. So um, one really cool thing that we learn about in disease evolution is that pathogens that keep their hosts alive and don't kill them are actually much better at, at spreading and, and reproducing than pathogens that kill their host really quickly, all right? And you know, COVID-19 is a great example of this. One of the reasons COVID-19 is so successfully spread across the world is because you don't develop symptoms right away. And for a large portion of individuals, it doesn't kill them. So it basically is able to use those hosts to spread to new ones. Whereas organisms that kill their hosts very quickly uh, don't have the opportunity to reproduce or spread to new living hosts. Awesome. Um, from Mrs. Uh, Kayali in Hatch House Montessori, where can we find these ants? So if you go to the iNaturalist page, you can actually look up a map. And I, I, I do have a, a slide for this one as well. Right. I wish I was a little bit more proficient in Zoom and could do this a little quicker, but okay. there we go. So this, this particular map shows, uh, as of yesterday, where all the different Ophiocordyceps species are. Now, there's lots of other zombie you know, fungus, but you know, Ophiocordyceps in particular can be found in these areas. Now, if we were to show a map of where the hosts are or the, the Campanotus, the carpenter ants are, it's basically the entire globe, right? So these are definitely not all of the zombie ants out there. We haven't even discovered most of these. Uh, 10 years ago, this map was empty. We didn't know a lot of these species existed. So these are pretty new. Um, but I will say that fungi in general like warm, moist climates, right? So while the ant might be able to survive in colder, drier climates like a desert, the fungus cannot, it needs moisture. So what, where you usually find them is in tropical areas or like on the coastal regions of, of continents. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in seeing if there's any near you, you can go to our uh, website and that'll give you a link to this map and you can kind of zoom in where, where you live and see if anybody has found any zombie ants around. Cool. Um, Charlene would like to know, this is from Jeremiah grade six, do these spores spread in the air and how do they travel by wind and how far can they travel to land on an ant? Yeah, so they, they do spread uh, on the air. As a matter of fact, the mushroom actually kind of shoots the spores out like a little harpoon. So like it, it contracts and squeezes these, these spores out and they, they can float on the wind. Now, how far they go is entirely based on, you know, conditions like how, how much wind is there? What's the moisture like? Um, is, is there a lot of foliage that it's going to bump into? So the spore doesn't necessarily need to land on an ant. Spores are very hardy, just like plant seeds. So they can kind of land on the ground and if an ant steps on it later, it can infect the ant. So um, in terms of how they get around, it's mostly wind-based. Um, and uh, in terms of how far they can go, it depends. But you know, we're, we're again talking about something that's really small. So um, you know, you're probably talking less, less than a mile uh, in terms of spread. 
cool. Um, Raisa would like to know, will the spread of this fungus eventually eliminate all ants or is there some kind of balancing mechanism? Uh, excellent question. So this kind of goes back to what is a good or bad pathogen, right? So at least when we look at um, infecting ants locally in terms of a nest, um, a lot of these, these ants kind of, or a lot of these ants are infected in a way where it's uh, persistent for both species. So it's kind of a balance in the act. Because again, if you are a fungus that's too aggressive and you eat all of your hosts, then you have no more hosts to spread to. If you are a fungus that doesn't do very well at manipulating the host, then the, the ants actually can get better. They, they're no, no longer sick. They'll fight off the infections. So it's, it's a constant balancing act. So it's unlikely that these ophiocordyceps will eliminate all ants. But you could have situations where certain populations or certain areas, you might eliminate a whole nest, but then that also eliminates that super aggressive strain of ophiocordyceps. So it's kind of like a, a lose-lose situation when you're too aggressive. And right. This allows nature to kind of counterbalance. Very cool. Um, the next question from uh, Verduzco, can the other ants tell when one of their ant friends is infected? Yes, they can. And it's, it's super cool, but also like a big problem when you're trying to do studies in a lab, because when you infect some ants, but not the rest of them, the ones that are still social can actually smell that the other ants are sick and they'll cannibalize them. So they'll eat them or they'll pull them apart and then take them to those graveyard sites that we talked about. And this is a way that the ants can actually prevent that from spreading in the nest. So when you're doing this in a lab, you kind of either have to infect all of the ants in a group, or you have to keep some ants separate from the rest of the ants. So it, it's a challenge when we're trying to study how these, especially when we're trying to study how these fungi affect social behaviors, because it's hard to keep them together. Right. Wow. Brutal, but important for the health of the, of the group. So I guess that's important. Um, okay. Jack, grade six, would like to know, are there parasites that can change human behavior? Um, maybe. So this, uh, let me bring up this, uh, picture of the mouse that I had again. So this, this picture of the mouse is uh, an example of Toxoplasma uh, gondii. I might be pronouncing that wrong, but it's a type of microorganism that infects the mouse and actually makes them more brave. So it, it makes them less afraid of mice and then mice can eat the mice. Then it spreads in the cats and then can re-spread back to mice in the environment. Now, one thing that we have found is uh, these types of toxoplasma can be found in humans. So it can, they can infect people too. Um, as a matter of fact, there is some correlative evidence that people with schizophrenia often frequently have these types of infections. Now, this is not to say that they cause schizophrenia. It's just an interesting observation. Uh, so when we say correlation, it doesn't mean that it causes the effect, but we, we have found that often these two things are found together. So there is at least some evidence that people can be infected by these and that it might affect our bodies in some way, shape or form. Um, but in terms of like the type of really intense behavioral changes that we see in the ant, um, not so much. This also raises an interesting question about, you know, what is like a behavioral manipulation versus what's a behavioral change? Because when, when we get sick, we kind of all act differently, don't we? Like uh, if you're sick, you don't feel good, you don't wanna go outside, you might stay in bed or you might drink soup when you otherwise wouldn't, right? So these are all behavioral changes, but you, one could argue that these behavioral changes are caused by us. You know, we're trying to get better and not caused by the pathogen, even though they're the, the reason that we're doing these things. Awesome. Um, the next question is from Paige in first grade. How do the ants know that it's time to climb? So we think, uh, so first of all, there's a d disease progression, right? So the, the fungus will start to manipulate ant behavior, you know, around two weeks. But we think there are definitely solar cues at play. So we think that uh, light plays a role in, in their climbing and then also uh, when the fungus actually erupts from the head. So I have one more, at least one more, one more slide to show you. So if you, you look at this picture right here, what this is basically showing you is the time of day 
And in each one of these red arrows is when the death grip for the ant occurred. Um, and then these are these are kind of like error bars in, in the in the study. So like you know within this kind of range. So what we see is is this line right here is solar noon. Um, and if you look at this graph, you might notice that a lot of the biting behavior happens around noon or slightly after. And this is when the sun is approximately highest in the sky, right? There's a lot of solar light. Um, whereas like in the morning and in twilight, you don't really see any ant biting. So we definitely think there are solar cues that are, are leading to uh, some of these behavioral manipulations and when the time is right. Um, also things like humidity matter, um, I'm sure the host fitness matters, you know, if they die too soon, then you don't really get to that point. Um, but we've also seen some very interesting uh, circadian rhythm stuff with the ants in, in terms of uh, when, when they're going out, you know, and usually these ants are nocturnal. So we see when they're infected by zombie ants, they kind of go out, you know, during the day, and otherwise probably wouldn't. So we think uh, solar cues play a big role in that. But this is something that we're, we're researching at UCF and it's a relatively new idea. Awesome. Um, are, okay, let's see. Are there any funguses that control humans? Uh, no, no real ones. There Good. are, there's definitely lots of fungal pathogens of humans. Like if you've ever had athlete's foot or if you're unfortunate enough to have oral thrush, these are examples of like yeast that grow on people, but they don't manipulate our behavior. If you are interested in make-believe fungus that infect people and manipulate behaviors, there's a really good Halloween zombie movie called The Girl with All the Gifts. And this is a movie about what if ophiocordyceps infected people. So it's, it's, a, it's a really great zombie movie, but it's, it's completely fiction. It's com completely fantasy. Cool. A couple people have asked, um, can you keep these these ants as pets? <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> so, yeah. So, like I said, the disease progression is about twelve weeks. Um, yeah, one thing that I I have done in the past though is you can kind of catch one of these zombie ants and kind of put it into resin. Cool. This is like a like a I think this is table glass, right? You just pour it and it solidifies, and you can keep them that way if you find one. Uh, but you know they don't stay alive for very long. That's awesome. Um, that's super cool. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade class, Zora would like to know, is this particular fungus found more readily in warm or humid environments? Does it prefer to avoid cold or dry locations? Yeah. So the answer to that question is both. So it, it needs both warmth and moisture, right? And this has to do with the way that the, the fungus, you know, interacts with its environment. So animals and people kind of take water with them. We drink and then it stays in our body and we're like 70% water or something like that, right? But these, these fungi need to get water from absorption, right? So they need to live on things that are moist or there needs to be lots of water in the air. Otherwise they dry out super quick. Right. Um, let's see, Ella would like to know, do the zombie ants still die if they don't eventually bite something? Like can they resist the urge to bite and survive? Uh, yes, so that's that's another interesting thing that happens in the lab um, because there's a really particular amount of sunlight and moisture and, and warmth and environmental things that we don't fully understand yet. It's actually difficult to get them to grow the mushroom in the lab. So oftentimes when we do the studies, we we can see the biting behavior, but the mushroom doesn't grow and a lot of ants will actually die before they even get to the biting behavior. Um, this might have to do with the way that we infect them with what is probably a much higher dose than what they're infected with in nature, right? A single spore lands on them and that's what makes the fungus. Whereas in lab, we kind of take it while it's already in that, that yeast phase and we put a bunch of it in the ant. So um, it's, it's, it's uh, yes, is the answer to the question. A lot of ants actually die before they make it to this perfect Goldilocks zone where the fungus is ready. That's awesome. Um, Rayanne would like to know, oops, I just uh, scrolled on me. Will the event, will the ant eventually die of starvation or dehydration or will the fungus completely take over the ant and then use the ant carcass as a nutrient source? Yes, both. Um, so uh, if in the cases where the, the fungus doesn't grow, that's probably a case where the ant just basically died from exhaustion or from, you know, dehydration, not eating, you know, these types of things. In the case where the mushroom does grow, the, the 
fungus gets enough nutrients and energy to make that happen, which is, you know, a really phenomenal feat, right? You're something that's microscopic and then you kind of all bend together to make this macroscopic mushroom. And in order to get the energy to do that, it eats the ant from the inside out. So basically all that's left is the, the carapace or the chitin shell of the insect. Great. Um, Rachel would like to know, do the spores benefit their environment? Well, um, that's a, I guess it depends on the way you look at it. So um, when we talk about these types of parasites or pathogens, you can actually think of them as a biocontrol check on carpenter ants. So at least here in Florida, uh, Campanotus floridanus, which is the Florida carpenter ant, is a pest for household owners because it likes to live in the wood um, or it likes to make you know, eat burrow into the wood, even though it doesn't eat it. It lives there, so it's it's kind of destroying the houses. So you can think of this as kind of like a way of limiting the population. Whereas if we were to just eliminate all opiocordyceps, ants might grow much more exponentially out of control. Mm -hmm. So when we look at you know how things interact with each other and the reason that these symbioses have kind of evolved, a lot of it has to do with you know these these checks and balances in the food web. And one thing you learn in biology um, is if you just eliminate one creature then the food web goes all out of whack. The things that eat that creature die because they don't have food. The things that are eaten by that creature get too abundant and then they eat the things underneath them too much and those die off. So it's, it's like a cascade effect that causes a lot of problems. So this has major implications when we talk about things like global warming, uh, where that affects creatures like insects much quicker than it affects animals. Because when you start eliminating things like pollen, pollinators, it has major cascading effects on the, the environment. Right. Yeah. If you're interested in like how taking up out one animal in an ecosystem can just totally mess things up. I'm reading a book right now called eager. It's and the subtitle is something, something beavers. Um, and it's really, really interesting. And it, it talks all about how beaver, <coughs> sorry. Um, I opened the window for the first time and the allergies are suddenly a thing. Anyway. Um, the beavers in the United, in the in North America are like essential for so many things. And when white colonizers came over, we killed them all. And then uh, it has caused huge problems, not only with the animals that live here, the wolves and, and all sorts of other things, but like the fish that live in the streams. And it's completely affected how, um, basically how our earth can soak up uh, um, water. And it's, it's anyway, very interesting stuff. We should have a session about beavers because I am learning so much about beavers, but back uh, to fungus and insects. Let's ask another question because uh, we only have like five minutes left. Um, okay, so where do, can you explain one more time like how we use iNaturalist to find um, animals in our local environment? Sure, let me, let me pull that slide back up just so you guys have like kind of a picture idea of what I'm talking about. So iNaturalist is an app. You can download it for your mobile device or your laptop or your, or your iPad or whatever it is that you use for entertainment. And you can basically take a picture. So you go outside, uh, here, here are observations that I've made. So I found a lot of these little tiny uh, ladybug looking things on a plant. So I took a picture of it. And when you take that picture, um, it, it, you can upload it. And when you click to upload, it'll give you a list of things based on what other people have found and what scientists have called them. And it'll give you a list and say, it's probably one of these. And then it's up to you to pick which one you think is probably the closest. Now, when you post this, it does one of two things. Well, it actually does both of these. One, it'll, it'll post a GPS location where you found it, right? And this is how other people can come and look for them or how scientists can find out where they are located, you know, make these cool maps like the one I showed you for the opiocordyceps. Now, I, I do want to point out that you can actually disable that feature if, if you don't want people to know where you found these things. And the second thing it does is if you have a project like ours, like the zombie fungus foray, anytime anybody posts something that they think is an opiocordyceps, it populates to our page. So it gets put on our page. And scientists like us who study these can go through and actually go, yeah, that's, that is a Ophiocordyceps. Or if, it, if it's a different species, we can say, actually, we think this is this instead. Um, so we can help you identify these things. And like, if you're super interested in, in you know, competition or if you want to try to find a bunch of them, right, there's all these leaderboards where you can see who has identified the most things or who has found the most things or 
or like me, you can basically just pay, take pictures of everything and you have your own little portfolio of all the cool wildlife and animals that you found using this app. Awesome. I use iNaturalist all the time. It's super, super fun. Um, Cause a lot of times I don't know about the insects in my area. Like I find a cool insect and I'm like, what the heck is this? And so I go on iNaturalist and within seconds I can find out what it is. It's so, so helpful. Um, all right, Mrs. Kaoli asks, uh, why do the mushrooms grow on the head of the ants? Um, good question. <laughs> I don't know that I have a definitive answer for you. I will say that usually you only see one, you, um, but in certain cases, you can actually see them coming out of multiple areas. I guess it, it probably has to do with how much nutrients the ant has. Um, so ants have different casts, like minors and majors. Maybe if they're bigger ants, there's more nutrients to make more mushrooms. I'm not entirely sure. This is something that I haven't haven't looked at, but um, you know, it just seems like generally that's where it comes out. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you. I'm sure one of somebody else from my crew could probably answer that question, but uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe it has something to do with like the physiology of the ant in that area. Maybe it has to do with that being the highest part on the ant. So if you're gonna if you're gonna have an ant climb a leaf or climb a stem, you want to get the point is to get higher, right? So maybe the head is higher than the abdomen. I yeah, that's an interesting point you bring up, and and I don't have any proof for this, but I have some anecdotal evidence from what I've found. I've I have seen ants that will actually climb to the terminal end of a branch and then turn around and bite. So like they're facing up. Oh, I have seen that a couple of times, but it's it's not something that I think we've looked into a whole lot. Very cool. Um, okay, so we try to keep these at 45 minutes and you have answered so many questions for us and this has been so, so cool. But there are still a lot of questions uh, to be answered. So um, where can we find you on, on the internet? Okay, well, um, so if I'm not mistaken, um, you guys post these on- Yeah, so all of these uh, sessions are posted to youtube.com slash Skype a scientist. So um, if you want to watch this again, if you want to send it to a friend, you can um, check it out there. So then I'll leave this little slide up here for a couple more seconds so that you guys can go back and look at this. If you want to have me come talk to your class and learn more about this, you can always send me, you know, or if you have questions, you can send me an email at my UCF email. Um, if you're interested more about what zombie ants are and, and how to find them and the life cycle, you can go to our webpage, the zombiefungusforay.com. Um, if you're interested in kind of like news blurbs or like cool ants that other people have found, um, our zombie fungus for a Twitter page kind of populates, you know, every week or so new zombie ants and, and cool articles about them. So you can follow us there. Uh, this is relatively a new thing. I think we have like 10 followers. So uh, we just made this like last month. So uh, this is still kind of new. Um, and yeah, so you can reach us in all these different platforms. Um, definitely check out our iNaturalist page. There's a link at this website so that you don't have to go digging through iNaturalist to find it. Um, and there's some QR codes that, that'll help you as well. Awesome. Um, you can just leave that up for the rest of the time. It, it, that'll be helpful. Sure. Um, okay, and then we always end these sessions with the same two questions for everybody. The first question is, if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what would that be? Um, I, I think, you know, maybe the one thing I would point out, which is something that we've already kind of talked about is there's no reason to be afraid of these types of zombie, you know, fungus. They're, there's no way they're going to infect people. Uh, again, these are really host specific. Um, it's actually a very interesting thing to study host specificity in pathogens. Um, but that being said, you know, I think we're dealing with enough of our own, uh, uh, you know, health problems worldwide at this point with COVID. So um, I think, you know, at least if you're bored and you want to go out and look for some of these, don't be afraid that you're going to like get, an, get a zombie parasite or get infected or anything like that. Awesome. Um, and the second question that we ask everybody is, you still have everybody's attention in the whole world and you can tell them one thing about anything. It can be as serious and uh, big picture or silly and insignificant as you'd like. What do you want everybody to know? Um, I, would, I would say just for like a general the world audience, just stay curious. So like I said, most of these zombie ants were discovered in the last 10 years or so. Like before really? that we didn't 
know these existed. Um, Whoa. Some of these species are actually named after after the people who have found them. So uh, there's a Ophiocordyceps called Kim Flemingiae that's named after Kim Flemings, who found, I think she's a high school teacher who found one of these ants and, and got to name it. So um, just this year, there's been a publication of like 20 new species worldwide uh, through some of our collaborators. So, you know, there's all these really cool things outside just waiting for you to look at them, but we're often so busy in our lives that we pass by these and never even notice. There's zombie ants all over in Florida, and a lot of people don't even know they're there because they're tiny and they don't take the time to pay attention. So if you're feeling cooped up because of COVID-19 and you want to go do something outside that's fun and, you know, social distancing safe, uh, take your iNaturalist app, go outside and, and look in look in your flower bed, look for little insects, look for you know, new flowers and, and be curious, find out you know, a little bit more about the things that live around you. Awesome. Great advice. I cannot wait until it is pleasant enough outside for me to go back in the woods again. So it's my favorite thing to do. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Erin. Thank you for signing. Um, and everyone, thanks for, thank you for coming and bringing all your curiosity with you. Uh, our next Skype a Scientist live session um, is going to be next week. We're gonna, it's gonna be on Wednesday. We're gonna be learning about ocean microplastics with the phenomenal Sandra Schleier. So um, she's so cool. I mean, all, everybody that we have on the session is so cool because uh, I handpicked them, but Sandra's work, she uh, is in Puerto Rico and she like runs tours um, if you've ever heard of Bio Bay, that's this bay in Puerto Rico that uh, has a bunch of bioluminescent organisms. And so when you're swimming through it, like at night, things are glowing all around you. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in addition to the, to the plastics uh, that we'll be talking about. So that's super exciting. That's next week, Wednesday, 1 p.m. We hope to see you all there. Um, and you can always find out what's going on at Skype a Scientist by either following us on Twitter at Skype Scientist or Instagram Skype a Scientist. Um, and we'll we'll keep you updated on our website, skypeascientist.com. We always have all of the schedule going. I think we're scheduling now through like April. Um, so we hope to see you all at these sessions. You can always support us at patreon.com slash scientist. The more you support us, the more cool stuff we can do. And we're really hoping um, that we'll have enough support on Patreon to hire someone at least part-time, maybe this summer, so we can do more um, stuff out in our community when the pandemic is subsided enough for us to talk to people in in real life again. I can't wait. Okay. Uh, thank you again, William and Aaron for being with us today and everybody else. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for this was really, really, really cool. Okay. Bye.